The Dialectic of Sex The Case for Feminist Revolution 1970 By Shulamith Firestone Chapter 4 Down with Childhood For Nechemia, who will outgrow childhood before it is eliminated? Women and children are always mentioned in the same breath, women and children to the forts. The special tie women have with children is recognized by everyone. I submit, however, that the nature of this bond is no more than shared oppression. And that moreover this oppression is intertwined and mutually reinforcing in such complex ways that we will be unable to speak of the liberation of women without also discussing the liberation of children, and, vice versa. The heart of woman's oppression is her childbearing and childrearing role. And in turn children are defined in relation to this role and are psychologically formed by it, what they become as adults and the sorts of relationships they are able to form determine the society they will ultimately build. I have tried to show how the power hierarchies in the biological family, and the sexual repressions necessary to maintain it, especially intense in the patriarchal nuclear family, are destructive and costly to the individual psyche. Before I go on to describe how and why it created a cult of childhood, let us see how this patriarchal nuclear family developed. In every society to date there has been some form of the biological family and thus there has always been oppression of women and children to varying degrees. Engels, Reich, and others point to the primitive matriarchies of the past as examples, attempting to show how authoritarianism, exploitation, and sexual repression originated with monogamy. However, turning to the past for ideal states is too facile. Simone de Beauvoir is more honest in the second sex. Quotation from Simone de Beauvoir the peoples who have remained under the thumb of the goddess mother, those who have retained the matrilineal regime, are also those who were arrested at a primitive stage of civilization. The devaluation of women, under patriarchy, represents a necessary stage in the history of humanity, for it is not upon her positive value but upon man's weakness, that her prestige is founded. In woman are incarnated all the disturbing mysteries of nature, and man escapes her hold when he frees himself from nature. Thus the triumph of the patriarchate was neither a matter of chance nor the result of violent revolution. From humanity's beginnings their biological advantage has enabled the males to affirm their status as sole and sovereign subjects, they have never abdicated this position, they once relinquished a part of their independent existence to nature and to woman, but afterwards they won it back. Perhaps however, if productive work had remained within her strength, woman would have accomplished with man the conquest of nature, through both male and female, but because she did not share his way of working and thinking, because she remained in bondage to life's mysterious processes, the male did not recognize in her a being like himself. End of quotation from Simone de Beauvoir Thus it was woman's reproductive biology that accounted for her original and continued oppression, and not some sudden patriarchal revolution, the origins of which Freud himself was at a loss to explain. Matriarchy is a stage on the way to patriarchy, to man's fullest realization of himself, he goes from worshipping nature through women to conquering it. Though it's true that woman's lot worsened considerably under patriarchy, she never had it good, for despite all the nostalgia it is not hard to prove that matriarchy was never an answer to women's fundamental oppression. Basically it was no more than a different means of counting lineage and inheritance, one which, though it might have held more advantages for women than the later patriarchy, did not allow women into the society as equals. To be worshipped is not freedom. For worship still takes place in someone else's head, and that head belongs to man. Thus throughout history, in all stages and types of culture, women have been oppressed due to their biological functions. Turning to the past, while it offers no true model, is, however, of some value in understanding the relativity of the oppression, though it has been a fundamental human condition, it has appeared to differing degree in different forms. The patriarchal family was only the most recent in a string of primary social organizations, all of which defined woman as a different species due to her unique childbearing capacity. The term family was first used by the Romans to denote a social unit the head of which ruled over wife, children, 
and slaves. Under Roman law he was invested with rights of life and death over them all. Famulus means domestic slave, and familia is the total number of slaves belonging to one man. But though the Romans coined the term, they were not the first to develop the institution. Read the Old Testament, for example, the description of Jacob's family train as after a long separation he travels to meet his twin brother Esau. This early patriarchal household was only one of many variations on the patriarchal family taking place in many different cultures up to the present time. However in order to illustrate the relative nature of children's oppression, rather than comparing these different forms of the patriarchal family throughout history we need only examine the development of its most recent version, the patriarchal nuclear family. For even its short history, roughly from the 14th century on, is revealing, the growth of our most cherished family values was contingent on cultural conditions, its foundations in no sense absolute. Let's review the development of the nuclear family, and its construct childhood dash from the Middle Ages to the present, basing our analysis on Philippe Aries's Centuries of Childhood, a social history of family life. The modern nuclear family is only a recent development. Aries shows that the family as we know it did not exist in the Middle Ages, only gradually evolving from the 14th century on. Until then one's family meant primarily one's legal heredity line, the emphasis on blood ancestry rather than the conjugal unit. With respect to such legalities as the passing on of property, its primary function, there was joint estate of the husband and wife, and joint ownership by the heirs, only towards the end of the Middle Ages, with the increasing of paternal authority in the bourgeois family, was joint estate by the conjugal couple abolished, with joint ownership by all the sons giving way to the laws of primogeniture. Aries shows how iconography reflected the current values of society in the Middle Ages, either solitary compositions or large convivial groupings of people in public places with a standard, there is a dearth of interior scenes, for life did not take place inside a home. For at that time there was no retreat into one's private primary group. The family group was composed of large numbers of people in a constant state of flux and, on the estates of noblemen, whole crowds of servants, vassals, musicians, people of every class as well as a good many animals, in the ancient patriarchal household tradition. Though the individual might retire from this constant social interaction to the spiritual or academic life, even in this there was a community in which he could participate. This medieval family, lineal honor of the upper classes, in the lower nothing more than the conjugal pair planted in the midst of the community, gradually developed into the matchbox family that we know. Aries describes the change, it was as if a rigid polymorphous body had broken up and had been replaced by a host of little societies, the families, and by a few massive groups, the classes. Such a transformation caused profound cultural changes, as well as affecting the very psychological structure of the individual. Even the view of the life cycle of the individual has culturally evolved, for example, adolescence, which had never existed before, came in. Most important of these new concepts of the stages of life was childhood. Section 1 The Myth of Childhood In the Middle Ages there was no such thing as childhood. The medieval view of children was profoundly different from ours. It was not only that it was not child-centered, it literally was not conscious of children as distinct from adults. The child men and child women of medieval iconography are miniature adults, reflecting a wholly different social reality. Children then were tiny adults, carriers of whatever class and name they had been born to, destined to rise into a clearly outlined social position. A child saw himself as the future adult going through his stages of apprenticeship, he was his future powerful self when I was little. He moved into the various stages of his adult role almost immediately. Children were so little differentiated from adults that there was no special vocabulary to describe them, they shared the vocabulary of feudal subordination, only later, with the introduction of childhood as a distinct state, did this confused vocabulary separate. The confusion was based on reality, children differed socially from adults only in their economic dependence. They were used as another transient servant class, with the difference that because all adults began in this class, it was not seen as degrading, an equivalent would be the indentured servant of American history. All children were literally servants, it was their apprenticeship to adulthood. Thus for a long time after, in France, waiting on table was not considered demeaning because it had been practiced as an art by all the youthful aristocracy, 
this experience held in common by children and servants and the resulting intimacy that grew up between them has been bemoaned right down to the 20th century, as the classes grew more and more isolated from each other. This lingering intimacy was considered the cause of considerable moral corruption of children from the upper and middle classes. The child was just another member of the large patriarchal household, not even essential to family life. In every family the child was wet nursed by a stranger, and thereafter sent to another home, from about the age of 7 until 14 to 18, to serve an apprenticeship to a master, as I have mentioned, usually composed of or including domestic service. Thus he never developed a heavy dependence on his parents, they were responsible only for his minimal physical welfare. And they in turn did not need their children, certainly children were not doted upon. For in addition to the infant mortality rate, which would discourage this, parents reared other people's children for adult life. And because households were so large, filled with many genuine servants as well as a constant troop of visitors, friends and clients, a child's dependence on, or even contact with, any specific parent was limited, when a relationship did develop it might better be described as avuncular. Transmission from one generation to the next was ensured by the everyday participation of children in adult life, children were never segregated off into special quarters, schools, or activities. Since the aim was to ready the child for adulthood as soon as possible, it was felt quite reasonably that such a segregation would delay or stymie an adult perspective. In every respect the child was integrated into the total community as soon as possible, there were no special toys, games, clothes, or classes designed just for children. Games were shared by all age groups, children took part in the festivities of the adult community. Schools, only for specialized skills, imparted learning to anyone who was interested, of whatever age, the system of apprenticeship was open to children as well as adults. After the 14th century, with the development of the bourgeoisie and empirical science, this situation slowly began to evolve. The concept of childhood developed as an adjunct to the modern family. A vocabulary to describe children and childhood was articulated, for example, the French Le Bebe, and another vocabulary was built especially for addressing children. Childrenese became fashionable during the 17th century. Since then it has been expanded into an art and a way of life. There are all kinds of modern refinements on baby talk. Some people never go without it, using it especially on their girlfriends, whom they treat as grown-up children. Children's toys did not appear until 1600 and even then were not used beyond the age of three or four. The first toys were only child-size replicas of adult objects. The hobby horse took the place of the real horse that the child was too small to ride. But by the late 17th century special artifacts for children were common. Also in the late 17th century we find the introduction of special children's games. In fact these signified only a division, certain games formerly shared by both children and adults were abandoned by the adults to children and the lower class, while other games were taken over from then on exclusively for adult use, becoming the upper class adult parlor games. Thus, by the 17th century childhood as a new and fashionable concept was in. Arias shows how the iconography too reflects the change, with, for example, the gradual increase of glorified depictions of the mother-slash-child relationship, for example, the infant in the arms of Mary, or, later, in the 15th and the 16th centuries, of depictions of interiors and family scenes, including even individualized portraits of children and the paraphernalia of childhood. Rousseau among others developed an ideology of childhood. Much was made of children's purity and innocence. People began to worry about their exposure to vice. Respect for children, as for women, unknown before the 16th century, when they were still part of the larger society, became necessary now that they formed a clear-cut depressed group. Their isolation and segregation had set in. The new bourgeois family, child-centered, entailed a constant supervision, all earlier independence was abolished. The significance of these changes is illustrated by the history of children's costume. Costume was a way of denoting social rank and prosperity, and still is especially for women. The consternation even now, especially in Europe, at any clothing impropriety is due primarily to the impropriety of breaking rank, and in the days when garments were expensive and mass production unheard of, this function of clothing was even more important. Because clothing customs so graphically describe disparities of sex and class, the history of child fashion gives us valuable clues to what was happening to children.
The first special children's costumes appeared at the end of the 16th century, an important date in the formation of the concept of childhood. At first children's clothing was modeled after archaic adult clothing, in the fashion of the lower class, who also wore the hand-me-downs of the aristocracy. These archaisms symbolized the growing exclusion of children and the proletariat from contemporary public life. Before the French Revolution, when special trousers of naval origin were introduced, further distinguishing the lower class, we find the same custom spreading to upper-class male children. This is important because it illustrates quite clearly that children of the upper class formed a lower class within it. That differentiation of costume functions to increase segregation and make clear class distinctions is also borne out by an otherwise unexplainable custom of the 17th and the 18th centuries. Two broad ribbons had to be worn by both male and female children fastened to the robe under each shoulder and trailing down the back. These ribbons apparently had no other function than to serve as sartorial indications of childhood. The male child's costume especially reveals the connection of sex and childhood with economic class. A male child went through roughly three stages, the male infant went from swaddling clothes into female robes, at about the age of five he switched to a robe with some elements of the adult male costume, for example, the collar, and finally, as an older boy, he advanced to full military regalia. The costume worn by the older male child in the period of Louis XVI was at once archaic, Renaissance collar, lower class, naval trousers, and masculinely military, jacket and buttons. Clothing became another form of initiation into manhood, with the child, in modern terms, begging to advance to long pants. These stages of initiation into manhood reflected in the history of child costume neatly tie in with the Oedipus complex as I have presented it in the previous chapter. Male children begin life in the lower class of women. Dressed as women, they are in no way distinguished from female children, both identify at this time with the mother, the female, both play with dolls. Attempts are made at about the age of five to wean the child from its mother, to encourage it by slow degrees, for example, the male collar, to imitate the father. This is the transitional period of the Oedipus complex. Finally the child is rewarded for breaking away from the female and transferring his identifications to the male by a special grown-up costume, its military regalia a promise of the full adult male power to come. What about girls' costumes? Here is an astonishing fact, childhood did not apply to women. The female child went from swaddling clothes right into adult female dress. She did not go to school, which, as we shall see, was the institution that structured childhood. At the age of nine or ten she acted, literally, like a little lady, her activity did not differ from that of adult women. As soon as she reached puberty, as early as ten or twelve, she was married off to a much older male. The class basis of childhood is exposed, both girls and working class boys did not have to be set apart by distinctive dress, for in their adult roles they would be servile to upper class men, no initiation into freedom was necessary. Girls had no reason to go through costume changes, when there was nothing for them to grow up to, adult women were still in a lower class in relation to men. Children of the working class, even up to the present day, were freed of clothing restrictions, for their adult models, too, were children relative to the ruling class. While boys of the middle and upper classes temporarily shared the status of women and the working class, they gradually were elevated out of these subjected classes, women and lower class boys stayed there. It is no coincidence, either, that the effeminization of little boys' dress was abolished at the same time that the feminists agitated for an end to oppressive women's clothes. Both dress styles were integrally connected to class subjection and the inferiority of women's roles. Little Lord Fauntleroy went the way of the petticoat. Though my own father remembers his first day in long pants, and even today, in some European countries, these clothing initiation customs are still practiced. We can also see the class basis of the emerging concept of childhood in the system of child education that came in along with it. If childhood was only an abstract concept, then the modern school was the institution that built it into reality. New concepts about the life cycle in our society are organized around institutions, for example, adolescence, a construction of the 19th century, was built to facilitate conscription for military service, the modern school education was, indeed, the articulation of the new concept of childhood. Schooling was redefined, no longer confined to clerics and scholars, it was widely extended to become the normal instrument of social initiation, in the progress from childhood to manhood. Those for whom true adulthood never would apply, for example, 
girls and working-class boys, did not go to school for many centuries. For contrary to popular opinion, the development of the modern school had little connection with the traditional scholarship of the Middle Ages, nor with the development of the liberal arts and humanities in the Renaissance. In fact the humanists of the Renaissance were noted for the inclusion in their ranks of many precocious children and learned women, they stressed the development of the individual, of whatever age or sex, according to Arias, literary historians exaggerate the importance of the humanist tradition in the structure of our schools. The real architects and innovators were the moralists and pedagogues of the 17th century, the Jesuits, the Oratorians, and the Jansenists. These men were at the origins of both the concept of childhood and its institutionalization, the modern concept of schooling. They were the first espousers of the weakness and innocence of childhood, they put childhood on a pedestal just as femininity had been put on a pedestal, they preached the segregation of children from the adult world. Discipline was the keynote to modern schooling, much more important finally than the imparting of learning or information. For to them discipline was an instrument of moral and spiritual improvement, adapted less for its efficiency in directing large groups to work in common than for its intrinsic moral and ascetic value. That is, repression itself was adopted as a spiritual value. Thus, the function of the school became child-rearing, complete with disciplinary child psychology. Arias quotes the regulations for boarders at Poirier, a forerunner of our teacher training manuals. A close watch must be kept on the children, and they must never be left alone anywhere, whether they are ill or in good health, this constant supervision should be exercised gently and with a certain trustfulness calculated to make them think one loves them, and that it is only to enjoy their company that one is with them. This will make them love their supervision rather than fear it. This passage, written in 1612, already exhibits the mincing tone characteristic of modern child psychology, and the peculiar distance, at that time rehearsed, but by now quite unconscious, between adults and children. The new schooling effectively segregated children off from the adult world for longer and longer periods of time. But this segregation of child from adult, and the severe initiation process demanded to make the transition to adulthood, indicated a growing disrespect for, a systematic underestimation of, the abilities of the child. The precocity so common in the Middle Ages and for some time after has dwindled almost to zero in our own time. Today, for example, Mozart's feats as a child composer are hardly credible, in his own time he was not so unusual. Many children played and wrote music seriously then and also engaged in a good many other adult activities. Our piano lessons of today are in no way comparable. They are, in fact, only indications of child oppression, in the same way that the traditional women's accomplishments such as embroidery are superficial activity, telling us only about the subjugation of the child to adult whims. And it is significant that these talents are more often cultivated in girls than in boys, when boys study piano it is most often because they are exceptionally gifted or because their parents are musical. Arias quotes Heroard, Journal sur l'enfant cette large jeunesse de Louis XIII the detailed account of the Dauphin's childhood years written by his doctor, that the Dauphin played the violin and sang all the time at the age of seventeen months. But the Dauphin was no genius, later proving himself to be certainly no more intelligent than any average member of the aristocracy. And playing the violin wasn't all he did, the record of the child life of the Dauphin, born in 1601, of only average intelligence, tells us that we underestimate the capabilities of children. We find that at the same age that he played the violin, he also played more, the equivalent of golf for adults of that period, as well as tennis, he talked, he played games of military strategy. At three and four respectively, he learned to read and write. At four and five, though still playing with dolls, he practiced archery, played cards and chess, at six, with adults, and played many other adult games. At all times, just as soon as he was able to walk, he mixed as an equal with adults in all their activities, such as they were, professionally dancing, acting, and taking part in all amusements. At the age of seven the Dauphin began to wear adult male clothes, his dolls were taken away, and his education under male tutors began, he began hunting, riding, shooting, and gambling. But Harry S. says, We should beware of exaggerating the importance of this age of seven. For all that he had stopped playing, 
or should have stopped playing with his dolls, the Dauphin went on leading the same life as before, rather more dolls and German toys before seven, and more hunting, riding, fencing, and possibly playgoing after seven. The change was almost imperceptible in that long succession of pastimes which the child shared with the adult. What seems most clear to me from this description is this, that before the advent of the nuclear family and modern schooling, childhood was as little as possible distinct from adult life. The child learned directly from the adults around him, emerging as soon as he was able into adult society. At about the age of seven there was some sex role differentiation, it had to happen sometime, given the patriarchy in operation, but this was not yet complicated by the lower class position of children. The distinction as yet was only between men and women, not yet between children and adults. In another century, this had begun to change, as the oppression of women and children increasingly intertwined. In summary, with the onset of the child-centered nuclear family, an institution became necessary to structure a childhood that would keep children under the jurisdiction of parents as long as possible. Schools multiplied, replacing scholarship and a practical apprenticeship with a theoretical education, the function of which was to discipline children rather than to impart learning for its own sake. Thus it is no surprise that modern schooling retards development rather than escalating it. By sequestering children away from the adult world, adults are, after all, simply larger children with worldly experience, and by artificially subjecting them to an adult-slash-child ratio of 1 to 20 plus, how could the final effect be other than a leveling of the group to a median, mediocre, intelligence? As if this weren't enough, after the 18th century a rigid separation and distinction of ages took place, grades. Children were no longer able to learn even from older and wiser children. They were restricted in most of their waking hours to a chronological finely drawn peer group, and then spoon-fed a curriculum. Such a rigid gradation increased the levels necessary for the initiation into adulthood and made it hard for a child to direct his own pace. His learning motivation became outer-directed and approval-conscious, a sure killer of originality. Children, once seen simply as younger people, the way we now see a half-grown puppy in terms of its future maturity, were now a clear-cut class with its own internal rankings, encouraging competition, the biggest guy on the block, the brainiest guy in school, etc. Children were forced to think in hierarchical terms, or measured by the supreme when I grow up. In this the growth of the school reflected the outside world which was becoming increasingly segregated according to age and class. In conclusion, the development of the modern family meant the breakdown of a large, integrated society into small, self-centered units. The child within these conjugal units now became important, for he was the product of that unit, the reason for its maintenance. It became desirable to keep one's children at home for as long as possible to bind them psychologically, financially, and emotionally to the family unit until such time as they were ready to create a new family unit. For this purpose the age of childhood was created. Later, extensions were added, such as adolescence, or in 20th century American terms, teenagedom, collegiate youth, young adulthood, the concept of childhood dictated that children were a species different not just in age, but in kind, from adults. An ideology was developed to prove this, fancy tractates written about the innocence of children and their closeness to God little angels, with a resulting belief that children were asexual, child sex play an aberration, all in strong contrast to the period preceding it, when children were exposed to the facts of life from the beginning. For any admission of child sexuality would have accelerated the transition into adulthood, and this now had to be retarded at all cost, the development of special costumes soon exaggerated the physical differences distinguishing children from adults or even from older children. Children no longer played the same games as adults, nor did they share in their festivities. Children today do not normally attend fancy dinner parties, but were given special games and artifacts of their own. Toys, storytelling, once a community art, was relegated to children, leading to in our own time a special child literature. Children were spoken to in a special language by adults and serious conversation was never indulged in their presence, not in front of the children. The manners of subjection were instituted in the home, children should be seen and not heard. But none of this would have worked to effectively make of children an oppressed class if a special institution hadn't been created to do the job thoroughly, the modern school. The ideology of school was the ideology of childhood. It operated on the assumption that children needed discipline, 
that they were special creatures who had to be handled in a special way, child psych, child ed, etc., and that to facilitate this they should be corralled in a special place with their own kind, and with an age group as restricted to their own as possible. The school was the institution that structured childhood by effectively segregating children from the rest of society, thus retarding their growth into adulthood and their development of specialized skills for which the society had use. As a result they remained economically dependent for longer and longer periods of time, thus family ties remained unbroken. I have pointed out that there is a strong relationship between the hierarchies of the family and economic class. Engels has observed that within the family the husband is the bourgeois and the wife and children are the proletariat. Similarities between children and all working class or other oppressed groups have been noted, studies done to show that they share the same psychology. We have seen how the development of the proletarian costume paralleled that of children's costume, how games abandoned by upper-class adults were played by both children and yokels, both were said to like to work with their hands as opposed to the higher cerebrations of the adult male, abstractions beyond them, both were considered happy, carefree, and good-natured, more in touch with reality, both were reminded that they were lucky to be spared the worries of responsible adulthood, and both wanted it anyway. Relations with the ruling class were tinged in both cases by fear, suspicion, and dishonesty, disguised under a thin coating of charm, the adorable lisp, the arl and the shuffle. The myth of childhood has an even greater parallel in the myth of femininity. Both women and children were considered asexual and thus purer than man. Their inferior status was ill-concealed under an elaborate respect. One didn't discuss serious matters nor did one curse in front of women and children, one didn't openly degrade them, one did it behind their backs. As for the double standard about cursing, a man is allowed to blaspheme the world because it belongs to him to damn, but the same curse out of the mouth of a woman or a minor, i.e. an incomplete man to whom the world does not yet belong, is considered presumptuous, and thus an impropriety or worse. Both were set apart by fancy and non-functional clothing and were given special tasks, housework and homework respectively, both were considered mentally deficient, what can you expect from a woman? He's too little to understand. The pedestal of adoration on which both were set made it hard for them to breathe. Every interaction with the adult world became for children a tap dance. They learned how to use their childhood to get what they wanted indirectly, he's throwing another tantrum. Just as women learned how to use their femininity, there she goes, crying again. All excursions into the adult world became terrifying survival expeditions. The difference between the natural behavior of children in their peer group as opposed to their stilted and or coy behavior with adults bears this out, just as women act differently among themselves than when they are around men. In each case a physical difference had been enlarged culturally with the help of special dress, education, manners, and activity until this cultural reinforcement itself began to appear natural, even instinctive, an exaggeration process that enables easy stereotyping, the individual eventually appears to be a different kind of human animal with its own peculiar set of laws and behavior, I'll never understand women. You don't know a thing about child psychology. Contemporary slang reflects this animal state, children are mice, rabbits, kittens, women are called chicks, birds, in England, hens, dumb clucks, silly geese, old mares, bitches. Similar terminology is used about males as a defamation of character, or more broadly only about oppressed males, stud, wolf, cat, stag, jack, and then it is used much more rarely, and often with a specifically sexual connotation. Because the class oppression of women and children is couched in the phraseology of cute it is much harder to fight than open oppression. What child can answer back when some inane aunt falls all over him or some stranger decides to pat his behind and gurgle baby talk? What woman can afford to frown when a passing stranger violates her privacy at will? If she responds to his, baby you're looking good today. With no better than when I didn't know you, he will grumble, what's eating that bitch? Or worse. Very often the real nature of these seemingly friendly remarks emerges when the child or the woman does not smile as she should, dirty old scumbag. I wouldn't screw you even if you had a smile on your puss. Nasty little brat. If I were your father I would spank you so hard you wouldn't know what hit you. Their violence is amazing. Yet these men feel that the woman or the child is to blame for not being friendly. Because it makes them uncomfortable to know that the woman or the child or the black or the workman is grumbling. The oppressed groups must also appear to like their oppression, smiling and simpering though they may feel like hell inside. 
The smile is the child-slash-woman equivalent of the shuffle, it indicates acquiescence of the victim to her own oppression. In my own case, I had to train myself out of that phony smile, which is like a nervous tick on every teenage girl. And this meant that I smiled rarely, for in truth, when it came down to real smiling, I had less to smile about. My dream action for the women's liberation movement, a smile boycott, at which declaration all women would instantly abandon their pleasing smiles, henceforth smiling only when something pleased them. Likewise children's liberation would demand an end to all fondling not welcomed by the child itself. This of course would predicate a society in which fondling in general was no longer frowned upon, often the only demonstration of affection a child now receives is of this phony kind, which he may still consider better than nothing, many men can't understand that their easy intimacies come as no privilege. Do they ever consider that the real person inside that baby or female animal may not choose to be fondled then, or by them, or even noticed? Imagine this man's own consternation were some stranger to approach him on the street in a similar manner, patting, gurgling, muttering baby talk, without respect for his profession or his manhood. In sum, if members of the working class and minority groups act like children, it is because children of every class are lower class, just as women have always been. The rise of the modern nuclear family, with its adjunct childhood, tightened the noose around the already economically dependent group by extending and reinforcing what had been only a brief dependence, by the usual means, the development of a special ideology, of a special indigenous lifestyle, language, dress, mannerisms, etc. And with the increase and exaggeration of children's dependence, woman's bondage to motherhood was also extended to its limits. Women and children were now in the same lousy boat. Their oppressions began to reinforce one another. To the mystique of the glories of childbirth, the grandeur of natural female creativity, was now added a new mystique about the glories of childhood itself and the creativity of child-rearing. Why, my dear, what could be more creative than raising a child? By now people have forgotten what history has proven, that raising a child is tantamount to retarding his development. The best way to raise a child is to lay off. Section 2 Our time, the myth is magnified. We have seen how the increasing privatization of family life brought ever more oppression to its dependents, women and children. The interrelated myths of femininity and childhood were the instruments of this oppression. In the Victorian era they reached such epic proportions that finally women rebelled, their rebellion peripherally affecting childhood. But the rebellion was destroyed before it could eliminate these myths. They went underground to reappear in a more insidious version, complicated by mass consumerism. For in fact nothing had changed. In Chapter 2 I described how the emancipation of women was subtly sabotaged, the same thing occurred in the corollary oppression childhood. The pseudo-emancipation of children exactly parallels the pseudo-emancipation of women, though we have abolished all the superficial signs of oppression, the distinct and cumbrous clothing the schoolmaster's rod, there is no question that the myth of childhood is flourishing in epic proportions, 20th century style, whole industries are built on the manufacture of special toys, games, baby food, breakfast food, children's books and comic books, candy with child appeal, etc., market analysts study child psychology in order to develop products that will appeal to children of various ages, there is a publishing, movie, and TV industry built just for them, with its own special literature programs and commercials, and even censorship boards to decide just which cultural products are fit for their consumption, there is an endless proliferation of books and magazines instructing the layman in the fine art of child care, Dr. Spock, Parents Magazine, there are specialists in child psychology, child education methods, pediatrics, and all the special branches of learning that have developed recently to study this peculiar animal. Compulsory education flourishes and is now widespread enough to form an inescapable net of socialization, brainwashing, from which even the very rich can no longer entirely escape. Gone are the days of Huckleberry Finn, today the malingerer or dropout has a full-time job just in warding off the swarm of specialists studying him, the proliferating government programs, the social workers on his tail. Let's look more closely at the modern form this ideology of childhood takes, visually it is as beefy, blonde and smiling as a Kodak advertisement. As is the case with the exploitation of women as a ready-made, consumer class, 
There are many industries eager to profit from children's physical vulnerability, for example, St. Joseph's Aspirin for children, but even more than their health, the key word to the understanding of modern childhood is happiness. You are only a child once, and this is it. Children must be living embodiments of happiness, sulky or upset or disturbed children are immediately disliked, they make of the myth a lie, it is every parent's duty to give his child a childhood to remember, swing sets, inflated swimming pools, toys and games, camping trips, birthday parties, etc. This is the golden age that the child will remember when he grows up to become a robot like his father. So every father tries to give his son whatever it was he missed most himself in what should have been a most glorious stage of his own life. The cult of childhood as the golden age is so strong that all other ages of life derive their value from how closely they resemble it. In a national cult of youth, grown-ups make asses of themselves with their jealous apologetics, of course I'm twice your age, dear, but... There is the general belief that progress has been made because at least in our time children have been freed from the ugly toils of child labor and many other traditional exploitations of past generations. In fact there is even the envious moan that children are getting too much attention. They are spoiled. When I was your age. Parallels women have it easy. A major bulwark for this myth of happiness is the continued rigid segregation of children from the rest of society. The exaggeration of their distinctive features has made of them, as it was designed to, almost another race. Our parks provide the perfect metaphor for our larger age segregated society, a special playground for the tender untouchables, mothers and young children, one seldom finds anyone else here, as if by decree, an athletic field or swimming pool for the youth, a shady knoll for young couples and students, and a bench section for the elderly. This age segregation continues throughout the life of every modern individual, people have very little contact with children once they have outgrown their own childhood. And even within their own childhood, as we have seen, there are rigid age segregations, so that an older child will be embarrassed to be seen with a younger one. Tag along. Why don't you go play with someone your own age, throughout school life, and that is a rather long time in our century, a child remains with others only a year or two in age from himself. The schools themselves reflect these increasingly rigid gradations, junior-junior high, senior-junior high, etc., marked by a complex system of promotions and graduations, lately even graduations from nursery school and or kindergarten are common. So by the time a child grows old enough to reproduce himself he has no contact whatever with those outside his own narrow adult age group, and certainly not with children. Because of the cult surrounding it he can barely remember even his own childhood, often blocking it entirely. Even as a child he may have attempted to mold himself to the myth, believing that all other children were happier than he. Later, as a teenager, he may have indulged in a desperate joyousness, flinging himself into fun dash when really adolescence is a horror to live through, in the spirit of you are only young once. But true youth is unaware of age dash youth is wasted on the young dash and is marked by real spontaneity, the absence of precisely this self-consciousness. The storing up of happiness in this manner to think of when you no longer have it is an idea only old age could have produced, such an absence of contact with the reality of childhood makes every young adult ripe for the same sentimentalization of children that he himself probably despised as a child. And so it goes, in a vicious circle, young adults dream of having their own children in a desperate attempt to fill up the void produced by the artificial cutoff from the young, but it is not until they are mired in pregnancies and pampers, babysitters and school problems, favoritism and quarreling that they again, for a short period, are forced to see that children are just human like the rest of us. So let's talk about what childhood is really like, and not of what it is like in adult heads. It is clear that the myth of childhood happiness flourishes so wildly not because it satisfies the needs of children but because it satisfies the needs of adults. In a culture of alienated people, the belief that everyone has at least one good period in life free of care and drudgery dies hard. And obviously you can't expect it in your old age. So it must be you've already had it. This accounts for the fog of sentimentality surrounding any discussion of childhood or children. Everyone is living out some private dream in their behalf. Thus segregation is still operating full blast to reinforce the oppression of children as a class. What constitutes this oppression in the 20th century? Physical and economic dependence. The natural physical inferiority of children relative to adults, their greater weakness, their smaller size, is reinforced, rather than compensated for, 
By our present culture, children are still minors under the law, without civil rights, the property of an arbitrary set of parents. Even when they have good parents, there are just as many bad people in the world as good dash and the bad people are considerably more likely to bear children. The number of child beatings and deaths every year testifies to the fact that merely unhappy children are lucky. A lot worse could happen. It is only recently that doctors saw fit to report these casualties, so much were children at the mercy of their parents. Those children without parents, however, are even worse off, just as single women, women without the patronage of a husband, are still worse off than married women. There is no place for them but the orphanage, a dumping ground for the unwanted. But the oppression of children is most of all rooted in economic dependence. Anyone who has ever observed a child wheedling a nickel from its mother knows that economic dependence is the basis of the child's shame. Relatives who bring money are often the best liked. But make sure you give it directly to the kid, though he may not be starving to death, neither would he be if children had their own employment, black children who shine shoes, beg, and cultivate various rackets, and working-class white boys who sell papers, are envied in their neighborhood. He is dependent for his survival on patronage, and that's a bad state to be in. Such extreme dependence is hardly worth the bread. It is in this area that we find one of the pivots of the modern myth. We are told that childhood represents great progress, immediately calling to mind Dickensian images of poor, gaunt children struggling in a coal pit. We have shown, however, in the brief history of childhood presented earlier in this chapter, that middle-class and upper-class children were not laboring at the dawn of the industrial era, but were safely ensconced in some dull schoolhouse studying Homer and Latin grammar. The children of the lower class, it is true, were not considered any more privileged than their fathers, sharing the inhuman tortures to which all members of their class had to submit, so that at the same time as there were idle Emma Boveries and little Lord Fauntleroys, there were also women destroying their lives and lungs in early textile mills and children roaming, begging. This difference between the lives of children of the different economic classes persisted right up until the days of the women's vote and into our own time. Children who were the reproductive chattel of the middle class were enduring soul-squeezing worse than our own, so were women. But they, to offset this, had economic patronage. Children of the lower class were exploited, not particularly as children, but generally, on a class basis, the myth of childhood was too fancy to waste on them. Here again we see illustrated just how arbitrary a myth childhood was, ordered expressly for the needs of the middle class family structure. Yes, you say, but surely it would have been better for the children of the working class could they too have lived sheltered by this myth. At least they would have been spared their lives. So that they could sweat out their spiritual lives in some schoolroom or office? The question is rhetorical, like wondering whether the suffering of the blacks in America is authentic because they would be considered rich in some other country. Suffering is suffering. No, we have to think in broader terms here. Like, why were their parents being exploited in the first place? What is anybody doing down in that coal mine? What we ought to be protesting, rather than that children are being exploited just like adults, is that adults can be so exploited. We need to start talking not about sparing children for a few years from the horrors of adult life, but about eliminating those horrors. In a society free of exploitation, children could be like adults, with no exploitation implied, and adults could be like children, with no exploitation implied. The privileged slavery, patronage, that women and children undergo is not freedom. For self-regulation is the basis of freedom, and dependence the origin of inequality. Sexual repression. Freud depicts the early contentment of the child, the satisfaction of the infant at the breast of the mother, which it then tries to regain for the rest of its life, how, due to adult protection, the child is freer from the reality principle and is allowed to play, activity done for the pleasure of it, and not to achieve any other end, how, sexually, the child is polymorphous and only later is so directed and repressed as to make him fit only for adult genital sex pleasure. Freud also showed the origins of the adult neurosis to be built into the very processes of childhood. Though the prototypical child may have the capacity for pure pleasure, that does not mean that he can fully indulge it. It would be more correct to say that though by nature inclined to pleasure, to the degree that he becomes socialized, repressed, he loses this inclination. And that begins right away. The reality principle is not reserved for adults. It is introduced into the child's life almost immediately on his own small scale. For as long as such a reality principle exists, 
The notion of sparing the child its unpleasantness is a sham. At best he can go through a retarded repressive process, but more often the repression takes place as soon as he can handle it, at all levels. It is not as though there is ever a blessed period when reality lays off. For in truth the repression begins as soon as he is born, the well-known formula by clock feedings only an extreme example. Before the age of 18 months, says Robert Stoller, the basic sex differentiation has set in, and as we have seen, this process in itself demands inhibition of the sex drive towards the mother. So from the beginning his polymorphous sexuality is denied free play. Even now, with a campaign to recognize masturbation as normal, many infants are kept from playing with themselves while still in their cribs, the child is weaned and toilet trained, the sooner the better, both traumatic and child terms. Repressions increase. The mother love that ideally is meant to be such perfect fulfillment, unconditional, is used in the manner of father love, to better direct the child into socially approved conduct. And finally an active identification with the father is demanded. In fatherless homes the identification may occur somewhat later, when the child begins school, from here until puberty the child must lead a sexless, or secretive, life, not even admitting any sexual needs. Such forced asexuality produces a frustration that is at least partially responsible for the extreme rambunctiousness and aggressiveness, or alternately the anemic docility, that often make children so trying to be around. Family Repression We don't need to elaborate on the subtle psychological pressures of family life. Think of your own family. And if that isn't enough, if you are actually that one in a million who is truly convinced that you had a happy family, read some of the work of R.D. Lang particularly the polities of the family, on the game of happy families. Lang exposes the internal dynamics of the family, explaining its invisibility to the ordinary family member. Quotation by R. D. Lang One thing is often clear to an outsider, there are concerted family resistances to discovering what is going on, and there are complicated stratagems to keep everyone in the dark, and in the dark that they are in the dark. The truth has to be expended to sustain a family image, since this fantasy exists only in so far as it is in everyone who shares in it, anyone who gives it up shatters the family and everyone else. End of quotation by R. D. Lang And here are a few children speaking for themselves. Again we quote Rake. Quotation by Rake I was told of a boy, who, until he was almost four years old, thought that his name was shut up. A boy witnessed a furious quarrel between his parents and heard his mother threaten his father with divorce. When he returned home from school the next day, he asked his mother, Are you divorced yet? He remembered later being very disappointed because she had not gotten divorced. A boy of nine years was asked by his visiting father at camp if he felt homesick, and the boy replied, No. The father then asked if the other boys felt homesick. Only a few, said the child, those who have dogs at home. Quotation by Rake What is amusing about these anecdotes, if indeed they are amusing, is the candor of children unable to understand or accept the masochistic hell of it all. Educational Repression It is at school that the repression is cemented. Any illusions of freedom remaining are quickly wiped out now. All sexual activity or physical demonstrativeness is barred. Here is the first heavily supervised play. Children's natural enjoyment of play is now co-opted to better socialize, repress, them. Larry did the best finger painting. What a good boy. Your mother will be proud of you, in some liberal schools all the way up, it is true, good teachers try to find subjects and activities that will truly interest children. It's easier to keep the class in order that way, but as we have seen, the repressive structure of the segregated classroom itself guarantees that any natural interest in learning will finally serve the essentially disciplinary interests of the school. Young teachers entering the system idealistic about their jobs suddenly are up against it, many give up in despair. If they had forgotten what a jail school was for them, it all comes back now. And they are soon forced to see that though there are liberal jails and not so liberal jails, by definition they are jails. The child is forced to go to them, the test is that he would never go of his own accord. School's out, school's out, teachers let the fools out, no more pencils, no more books, no more teachers' dirty looks, 
and though enlightened educators have devised whole systems of inherently interesting discipline activities to lure and bribe the child into an acceptance of school, these can never fully succeed, for a school that existed solely to serve the curiosity of children on their own terms and by their own direction would be a contradiction in terms, as we have seen, the modern school in its structural definition exists to implement repression. The child spends most of his waking hours in this coercive structure or doing homework for it. The little time that is left is often taken up with family chores and duties. He is forced to sit through endless family arguments, or, in some liberal families, family councils. There are relatives at whom he must smile, and often church services that he must attend. In the little time left, at least in our modern middle class, he is supervised, blocking the development of initiative and creativity. His choice of play materials is determined for him, toys and games, his play area is defined, gyms, parks, playgrounds, campsites, often he is limited in his choice of playmates to children of the same economic class as himself, and in the suburbs, to his schoolmates, or children of his parents' friends, he is organized into more groups than he knows what to do with, boy scouts, cub scouts, girl scouts, brownies, camps, after-school clubs and sports. His culture is chosen for him. On TV he is often allowed to watch only pap children's programs, Father Knows Best, and is barred from all adult, good, movies. His books and literature are often taken from corny children's lists. Dick and Jane. The Bobsy Twins. The Partridge Family. The Annals of Babe Ruth. Robinson Crusoe. Lassie ad nauseum. The only children who have the slightest chance of escape from this supervised nightmare, but less and less so are children of the ghettos and the working class where the medieval conception of open community, living on the street, still lingers. That is, historically, as we have seen, many of these processes of childhood came late to the lower class, and have never really stuck. Lower class children tend to come from large immediate families composed of people of many different ages. But even when they don't, often there are half-brothers and sisters, cousins, nieces, nephews, or aunts, in a constantly changing milieu of relatives. Individual children are barely noticed, let alone supervised, children are often allowed to roam far from home or play out on the streets until all hours. And on the street, if by chance their family size is limited, there are hundreds of kids, many of whom have formed their own social groupings, gangs. They do not often receive toys, which means they create their own. I have seen ghetto kids devise ingenious slides out of cardboard and put them up against old tenements with missing steps, I have seen others make go-karts and pulleys out of old tire wheels and string and boxes. No middle-class child does that. He doesn't need to. But as a result he soon loses that ingenuity, they explore far afield of their own few blocks, and much more often than their middle-class contemporaries make the acquaintance of adults on an equal level. In class they are wild and unruly, as indeed they ought to be, for the classroom is a situation that would make any even partially free person suspicious. There is a lingering disrespect for school in the lower class, for, after all, it is a middle class phenomenon in origin. Sexually, too, ghetto kids are freer. One fellow told me that he can't remember an age when he didn't have sexual intercourse with other kids as a natural thing, everyone was doing it. Those who teach in ghetto schools have remarked on the impossibility of restraining child sexuality, it's a groovy thing, the kids love it, and it far surpasses a lesson about the great American democracy or the contribution of the Hebrews who developed monotheism or coffee and rubber as the chief exports of Brazil. So they do it on the stairs. And stay away from school the next day. If, in modern America, free childhood exists in any degree, it exists in the lower class, where the myth is least developed. Why then do they turn out worse than middle-class kids? Perhaps this is obvious. But I shall answer from my experience living and teaching in the ghettos, ghetto kids are not lower in intelligence until they reach adulthood, and even this is debatable, lower-class children are some of the brightest, brassiest, and most original children around. They are that way because they are left alone. If they do not do well on tests, perhaps we ought to re-examine the tests and not the children, later. In confronting a reality principle very different from the middle class one, they are drained and smashed, they will never outgrow their economic subjection. Thus it is day by day oppression that produces these listless and unimaginative adults, the ubiquitous restrictions on their personal freedom to expand, not their wild childhood. But children of the ghettos are only relatively free. They are still dependent, and they are oppressed as an economic class. 
there is good reason that all children want to grow up. Then at least they can leave home, and, finally, have a chance to do what they want to do. There is some irony in the fact that children imagine that parents can do what they want, and parents imagine that children do. When I grow up. Parallels owe to be a child again, they dream of love and sex, for they live in the driest period of their lives. Often when confronted with their parents' misery, they make firm vows that when they grow up, that won't happen to them, they build glorious dreams of perfect marriages, or of no marriage at all, smarter children, who realize the fault lies in the institution, not in their parents, of money to spend as they please, of plenty of love and acclaim, they want to appear older than they are and are insulted if told that they appear younger than they are. They try fiercely to disguise the ignorance of affairs that is the peculiar physical affliction of all children. Here is an example from Rick's Sex in Man and Woman of the little cruelties to which they are constantly subjected. Quotation from Rake I had some fun with a boy four years old, whom I told that a certain tree in his parents' garden bore pieces of chewing gum. I had bought some chewing gum and had hung the sticks by strings on the lower bough of the tree. The boy climbed up and picked them. He did not doubt that they grew on the tree, nor did he consider that they were wrapped in paper. He willingly accepted my explanation that the sticks of gum, blossoming at different times, had various flavors. In the following year when I reminded him of the chewing gum tree, he was very ashamed of his previous credulity and said, Don't mention that. End of quotation from Rake's Sex in Man and Woman Some children, in an attempt to fight this constant ridicule of their gullibility, when they see that their painful ignorance is considered cute-try to cash in on it, in much the same way that women do. Hoping to elicit that hug and kiss, they purposely take things out of context, but it seldom works the second time, perplexing them. What they don't understand is that the ignorance itself is considered funny, not its specific manifestations. For most children don't understand the arbitrary adult order of things, inadequately explained even when there is a sound explanation. But, in almost every case given the amount of information the child begins with, his conclusions are perfectly logical. Similarly if an adult were to arrive on a strange planet to find the inhabitants building fires on their roofs, he might assume an explanation but his conclusions, based on his dissimilar past, might cause the others some amusement. Every person in his first trip to a foreign country, where he knows neither the people nor the language, experiences childhood. Children, then, are not freer than adults. They are burdened by a wish fantasy in direct proportion to the restraints of their narrow lives, with an unpleasant sense of their own physical inadequacy and ridiculousness, with constant shame about their dependence, economic and otherwise, mother, may I? And humiliation concerning their natural ignorance of practical affairs. Children are oppressed at every waking minute. Childhood is hell. The result is the insecure, and therefore aggressive slash defensive, often obnoxious little person we call a child. Economic, sexual, and general psychological oppressions reveal themselves in coyness, dishonesty, spite, these unpleasant characteristics in turn reinforcing the isolation of children from the rest of society. Thus their rearing, particularly in its most difficult personality phases, is gladly relinquished to women, who tend, for the same reason, to exhibit these personality characteristics themselves. Except for the eager rewards involved in having children of one's own, few men show any interest in children. And fewer still grant them their due political importance. So it is up to feminist, ex-child and still oppressed child women, revolutionaries to do so. We must include the oppression of children in any program for feminist revolution or we will be subject to the same failing of which we have so often accused men, of not having gone deep enough in our analysis, of having missed an important substratum of oppression merely because it didn't directly concern us. I say this knowing full well that many women are sick and tired of being lumped together with children, that they are no more our charge and responsibility than anyone else's will be an assumption crucial to our evolutionary demands. It is only that we have developed, in our long period of related sufferings, a certain compassion and understanding for them that there is no reason to lose now, we know where they're at, what they're experiencing, because we, too, are still undergoing the same kind of oppressions. The mother who wants to kill her child for what she has had to sacrifice for it, a common desire, learns to love that same child only when she understands that it is as helpless, 
as oppressed as she is, and by the same oppressor, then her hatred is directed outwards, and mother love is born. But we will go further, our final step must be the elimination of the very conditions of femininity and childhood themselves that are now conducive to this alliance of the oppressed, clearing the way for a fully human condition.